Well, I'd, I'd love to just touch first upon like, as far as diving into what first you think of when you think of your dad, was he the photographer first for you? Was he the writer? How do you view that first view of what your dad was when you were a young man? Well, um, photography. Mm -hmm. That was the uh, first encounter. And uh, I worked with him as a young man, 10, 10, 11, lugging his bags and loading his cameras and traveling all around the world with him and learning the business. Was there a particular place you got to go that really stood out? I mean, your dad did get to go all around the world, and then later, I mean, you got to travel yourself. Yeah, I, I traveled with him. Uh, we went to Paris, France, uh, lived there for about five, six years, and then we went to uh, Nice, Nice on the coast, and uh, we uh, uh, had a place down there. And then we went on and uh, to uh, other places like Switzerland and uh, where else did we go? <laughs> we went to a lot of places because he was shooting for life international. So we, they had him all over the place. As far as Kansas, what it means to you, your, your dad famously wanted to be buried back in Kansas. Knowing all that we've learned from the learning tree and his experiences, right. I'm curious, what does Kansas mean to you? And being knowing that he still wanted to give a legacy back here, with, and then obviously the school came about, but I'm curious, when you look at Kansas, what do you view of it? Because you weren't raised out here. You were no, in New York. I yeah. never came to Kansas until uh, a particular time. Uh, he was getting old. He had family here in Wichita. So I came, uh, he asked me to represent the family uh, for, and people were having funerals and they were dying. And I represented the family and, uh, uh, and kept coming back because they were dying left and right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that that occurred, and then uh, I worked with uh, Charles McAvee and Ken Lund, who's the mayor of uh, uh, Fort Scott, to establish the uh, museum, which is there now. You know. So I, I, you know, I've been doing Kansas for I don't know 15 years or so. And I, I come back, uh, come back for the celebration every year to uh, honor uh, my father and my family. All of them are buried there, and uh, all of them. <laughs> I'm the last standing dude. <laughs> Yeah. You're doing well, David. Yeah, you're standing well. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you man. I'm hanging in. I was the youngest in the family, so I'm the last to go. Well, hopefully not for a while. You keep keeping on. Um, you once recorded as saying your dad enjoyed being around kids, enjoyed being like with you guys and your friends. Like he yeah. almost enjoyed being a young yeah. at heart. That kept him fresh, you know. Uh, he did have some uh, older friends and so on, but he liked being around young people and it gives him the energy, you know. And uh, I, uh, we had a, we lived out in White Plains, New York, which is about 20 minutes outside the city. And we had a, a house out there and we had horses and we just uh, had a good time out there. And, uh, you know, uh, eventually everybody went their own way. Because uh, you know how families are, they tend to want to get away from each other, you know. 
But I was working with him on the films, you know, in New York. And my brother, Gordon Parks Jr., also, he was a filmmaker. He did, uh, he and I did Superfly, you know. And uh, we uh, did that after Shaft was made. Yeah, we just lost, sadly, Melvin Peebles. Melvin was a good friend of the family. Yeah. Very good friend. Good friend of dad's and mine and my brother. Uh, he was a hell of a dude. Very heavy dude. You know, uh, he and dad were old friends. And, uh, and I, I just can't say it anymore that he, he was really... Melvin was good, you know, he was an excellent filmmaker and uh, producer. One of the great elements of Shaft, your dad's work, your work with Superfly and all the films that you and your brother did, right. the music and the music in the films, there's so much wonderful time of that era captured in those films. Right, right. Can you talk a bit about creating that atmosphere with those films? They're iconic. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I got a call from Warner Brothers who are uh, re remake, uh, remake, remaking the album, redoing the album, and remastering it. And, uh, uh, they need some photographs that I took on the set. And... Uh, of course, they've done five, about five of Shaft with Samuel Jackson. That uh, it don't stop, you know. <laughs> it, it was uh, an iconic film, and it, it recently was uh, awarded the uh, into the film register of uh, the Library of Congress. So. That, that that was very nice, you know, very honorable. Historic, yeah. Yeah, historic. I don't know any film that's ever been made over five times. Uh, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> One of those shafts, uh, your dad was in there. Samuel Jackson said hello yeah, to you. Yeah, dad. dad did a little cameo in the shaft, you know. He... Uh, had a way of, uh, well, he, he really loved uh, doing that. Uh, who's the guy that did Birds, the director? Uh, Hitchcock? Hitchcock. Yeah, he really liked Hitchcock, you know. He did a story on him. <clears throat> uh, he came out to White Plains and we photographed him. Very spooky man. Oh, <laughs> very scared the hell out of me. But he's, he was cool, and he really liked uh, Hitchcock stuff, you know, Hitchcock film. And so he, uh, he pulled a, a cameo now and then just to keep in tune with the, with the deal, you know. I think your dad's hair looked a lot cooler than the bald head of Hitchcock in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Hitchcock was good, you know. Yeah. I'm curious, were you able to keep any of your dad's old cameras or maybe things he used while he was filming? Is there is there an artifact of your dad's that you've kept? Well, yeah, I, I had a, a number of, I had some of his film cameras, uh, still cameras, which I donated to the museum in uh, Fort Scott. Mm -hmm. So I donated them to the museum and for uh, an archive uh, situation, and uh, but I didn't I didn't have I didn't have many of them. I just took a few. He gave me the film camera, Aeroflex, yeah, and. Uh, what am I going to do with this thing is obsolete? <laughs> oh, figure it out. <laughs> so that that was... Uh, so uh, the, the stuff I did have, the cameras, are in Fort Scott at the museum. You've 
visited the elementary school yeah. named after your dad quite a bit. Yeah, I, when I come to Wichita, I do a, a little uh, uh, get together with the kids, and uh, which is really cool. Uh, there's a school in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, an elementary school I go to and talk to the kids. Uh, there's a high school in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been up there doing uh, uh, interviews and stuff. And there's about, he has about 19 schools that were named uh, and uh, were honored in his name, uh, which were built. You know, they built about 19 of them in New York, New Jersey, you know, uh, all over the place. What made you go to Austin? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I was working uh, as a, an, an advanced man uh, for Paramount. They hired me to go down and check locations and do the logistics uh, to pull to see what's out there, uh, what was available from food to whatever, extras. And, so that was my job in the beginning. And so uh, we, well, you, you know, it took about three years to pull it all together. I had a good time in Austin. <laughs> and uh, I uh, had been looking for a place to get off to. Uh, New York, 40 years. Eh, gets kind of old. Hello. And, uh, it gets kind of old after 40 years. Hollywood, I spent a lot of time in Hollywood, I spent a lot of time in New York, I spent a lot of time in England shooting films. So Austin uh, worked for me. You know, I liked it and I decided to come back after uh, I worked on a film with my brother in New York. And uh, it was a film called Aaron Los Angela for Columbia Pictures. And uh, I'm out there on the street uh, guarding the equipment. My brother's in this French restaurant eating escargot. And I said, there's something wrong with this picture. And so I said, I'm out of here. It was cold, too. I mean, we shot most of the films in the winter. Really? Yeah. That's not normal. Why the winter? Oh, it's normal. It's normal uh, uh, for a film. Uh, the uh, Normally, it takes to that point to get the money all in the bank. Mm. So, that's it's a timing thing with the money. Mm. You know... So we, when you're, when they're getting the money, they have to work under a certain time limit. And so most of the films that we shot in New York were in the winter. Shaft, Superfly, and uh, oh, uh, we did some documentaries. I find this fascinating. I grew up watching Sesame Street. Okay. Your dad's the namesake for Gordon, the character on the show. Huh. Knowing your dad's legacy, seeing how he crossed barriers, not just in race, but in age, like right. you have the elementary schools, how cool is it to know your dad's legacy is more than just the photos, the films, but he crosses yeah. so many barriers. You got that right. And you know, the, th the real legacy are the kids going to school there. And when you talk to those kids, man, and they, uh, they have questions that are really off the chart. And you look at their artwork and you look at their photography and you really see the influence he has on them. He has a, uh, and, uh, and that's in all the schools I go to, you know, they, 
He's got a tremendous influence on those kids. They're the future, you know. People like to say I'm the future. I, I got my own future. I got time for his future. <laughs> What do you remember about shooting Superfly? Any fun stories you, you can tell us? Man, I, I got, there's a thousands of them. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, an independent film. We didn't have that much money. We had about $350,000, which is not a lot of money. And we pulled it off, you know. Everybody came together. The writer, the producer, my brother and I, and everybody else worked together to make it happen. And uh, Curtis Mayfield came in and did the music, and it tied it all together. You know, your book, I think, is a very powerful book, The G.I. Diary. Oh, I'm thank curious. You. Thank you. Having told your story in that, how important is it to you to know that you've got that book out there, that you were able to get that that side of, of the story out there for you? Yeah, um, I'm very proud of it. It's uh, uh, the first book published uh, by a major publisher, Harper and Row. I'm working on... Uh, getting a producer to make a film, you know, so I'm working on that, and uh, so there, there, there's a, a film in the work, on it, you know, but I, I didn't get it published really, uh, my father's uh, agent uh, saw my letters when I uh, was writing him, and she thought it would, you know, this would make a really good book. And uh, so she she was uh, responsible, Gene Young, at Harbor Row, who was his agent. And uh, so when I came back, I, I when I was over there, I had no idea it was going to be a book. So when I got back, they told me that it was. That's the way it happened. You know. Writing to your dad, do you mind if I ask, was it tough to tell him what was going on? I mean, he'd seen a lot in his life. Yeah. But you were seeing stuff that not right. many people have seen. Yeah, I was, uh, it was his uh, advice to uh, tell him I was getting bored with the military thing. So he suggested that I keep a diary take my mind off it, which was a good idea, and then uh, take photographs, you know, and uh, stay busy, and uh, it, that, and it worked, you know, I mean, that military life can get awful bland, you know. As far as when you think of your dad now... What do you think of? What image comes into your mind of your dad? Do you think of him older man, younger man? What do you think of? Well, you know, he's, he's known as the Renaissance man uh, in, in New York. I, I mean, he, he really is not, not only a good filmmaker and the music and the poetry, and, but uh, he was... Uh, an icon, you know, and uh, in many respects of music and poetry and what I think of him, he, he, he was phenomenal. I don't think he ever went to sleep, <laughs> you know, uh, he just couldn't stop and uh, creating. Being from Fort Scott, his mother, when she passed, she told uh, her, uh, her husband to get Gordon to Minnesota, get him out of here. And so he went to Minnesota and really got a good education, you know. Minnesota's good when it comes to education. Just like Kansas is, Kansas is good, but... It, 
it's a little bit uh, one-sided, <laughs> to say the least. Well, I think your dad helped change that just with the learning tree alone. Well, you know, he had an influence on a lot of people, and uh, Kansas honored him, had, you know, respected him, and uh, paid tribute to him. So he he uh, he didn't want to come back, but for some reason he he thought it would be the best thing, you know, to uh, reunite with Kansas, you know. So that's what he did. That's what he did. And uh, have you seen the learning tree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was shot at Fort Scott. Yeah. And uh, I didn't work on that film. My brother worked on it. And uh, I was involved with Vietnam, coming out of Vietnam and everything. So you were busy. Yeah. You can say so. <laughs> You know, I didn't realize your dad, when he was a young man, uh -huh. was a semi-pro basketball player. He was a bit oh, of an yeah, athlete. Yeah, he was a good athlete. You know? Yeah. Yeah, he, he uh, was a very good athlete. He played with the uh, uh, House of David, who were the team that the Harlem Globetrotters used uh, as a, you know, uh, a playing team. And... Uh, there's a there's a photograph of him. One time they a uh, couple of times they used him on the on the Globetrotter as a substitute. Really? Yeah, he's in that that outfit, man. I mean, it's cool. But he was he was a tennis player, played a hell of a game of tennis. Uh, skier, he was a snow skier. Uh, we all did pretty much uh, those sports. Do you think that helped him stay alive as long as he did? Because he played tennis for until he was much older, right? Yeah, he played uh, until he was about 80, yeah. five, whatever. Well, you know, first of all, it's a healthy thing to do. Uh, I, I think that when you look at uh, uh, the filmmakers today, a lot of them are dying because they're not healthy and they get so consumed with film that they lose perspective on um, staying healthy and they just get so much into they can't stop creating and, uh, a lot of filmmakers that I knew are dead and they all died in their 60s all died in the system. So, David, is it in y'all's genes to keep on ticking, or why have you lasted this long, David? Well, you know, uh, basically, uh, I like I like film, I like photography, writing, and I like to, I do what I like to do. But other than that, it's the only thing I know how to do. So that's why I. Uh, I'm sitting here doing it now. So, yeah. Uh, I play uh, tennis. I play golf. I exercise. I stay, stay healthy. You know? And I don't get consumed in film 24-7, you know. I take it slow and easy.